All right, time again for another environmental science video. This one is from chapter 20 in your textbook. It's about water pollution. Uh, as usual, uh, I'll remind you at the outset, then when it comes to the AP exam and also tests in my class as well, uh, when it comes to pollution, they want you to name names. What is the source of the pollution? Uh, they want you to know uh, what its effects in the environment are and what its effects on human health are as well. So we know that going into it. The case study from this chapter talks about uh, out in Seattle, and uh, that's a kayaker enjoying Lake Washington, as the, uh, as the caption says. And the idea is that Seattle is now a very clean city. And uh, people I know who have been out there recently just say it's very environmentally uh, conscious, uh, the folks are out there, and it's very cleaned up. They were not always that way. And that's part of what happens sometimes. There's pollution events, and then people realize, hey, we got to do something about this, and then they turn it around. And uh, that's the... Uh, that's the case here in Seattle. So first of all, water pollution uh, here is uh, comes from point and non-points, as we're saying here. And it is called pollution because it has undesirable effects and uh, takes away from what you want the water to be um, used for. So uh, harms living organisms and is uh, unsafe for drinking and all this kind of stuff. So we've already talked a bunch about uh, how pollutants get into the water, and we'll talk more about it now. Point sources are easy to identify, and uh, you know exactly where they are. You can regulate them. That would be something put into the water from uh, an industrial process. Uh, and then there are non-point sources that are harder to distinguish. Um, a point source that you could uh, talk about, know exactly where it came from, was an oil spill. There was an Exxon Valdez was the name of the ship, and uh, there was an oil spill, so we knew exactly where that came from. Uh, we also, in 2011, had the BP Horizon leak that went on, and there, if you ever saw the footage of that, you could see exactly where the oil was coming from. Uh, so there we go, point and non-point sources. Non-point sources are harder to, to regulate, harder to find out exactly where they came from. Runoff from ag agricultural fields is an example of that. Um, pollutants that get on pavement and then go into the water uh, are an example of that. And uh, there you go. Okay, so um, as I said already here, uh, for uh, point and non-point sources, agriculture is a good one from this. And we've already talked about the idea of the fertilizers running in there. That's the nitrates and the phosphates. And uh, we could also talk about the idea of the uh, waste from livestock. And, uh, and that's true as well. Uh, mining as well. And we've talked about mining uh, having implications in the last chapter. We talked about uh, cyanide leaching for gold mining. And we've talked about lead. And we've talked about mercury coming from uh, mining as well. And uh, similar things also coming from industrial facilities. Okay, so uh, a good one to talk about here is parking lots as well. Like I said, if it's paved over and you have, uh, you know, things that are dripping out of the cars, the water hits the pavement uh, of the parking lot, and then it could roll down into the waterways, and uh, there you go. We've also talked a bunch in here about the idea of how much plastic uh, that human beings make, and a lot of that ends up in the water as well. And another thing that we have is the uh, climate change. Temperature is going up, and we've talked about how that is implicated in coral bleaching and uh, other problems associated with climate change, too. Okay, so here's a point, uh, well, I'm supposed to ask you, is that a point source or a non-point source? If you said it was a point source, you are correct. You can tell exactly where it's coming from. And how about this? Would you call that a point or a non-point source? The runoff from agricultural fields. Uh, and that is a non-point. You can't tell exactly where it came from. Okay, so there are uh, effects with the pollutants in the water. Uh, one of the things is getting sick from it. And in a slide that's coming up, it'll list a bunch of the infectious diseases that you can get from contaminated drinking water. And of course, this is a problem. And you can see at the bottom of the page that diarrhea is a big killer. And, and a big reason for that is you get sick from the water and you can't get rehydrated from water that made you sick in the first place and get healthy. So that's a big problem and that's, that's a terrible way to, to end up dying. All right, so that's uh, a lot of people that are affected by contaminated water. 
luckily for us in the United States, we've kind of realized something, uh, some of this, and we have done things to clean it up. Okay, so here we go, the slide that I was talking about. Now again, uh, I could re read these to you, I suppose, but the uh, best thing here for you to do is to maybe pause, take a look at this uh, screen here, and these are things that you should, should be very well uh, aware of. So I'll give you a moment to pause. And now that we're back... Um, we get a little chance to move on here. But this is great because uh, we've seen a lot of these in the free response questions. It gives you the examples that get you there, the sources of them, and what the effects are going to be as well. Uh, so there we go. Oxygen demanding wastes. We've talked about that idea, the dissolved oxygen in the water uh, drops down. That's where the biological oxygen demand goes up, the BOD goes up. Uh, we've of course, of course talked about nitrates and phosphates. And you can see uh, your lead, mercury, and arsenic that comes from mining and comes from uh, landfills. And these are good things to know. I've talked a couple of times about thermal pollution. And again, that might change the range of tolerance for some of your species. And it also cuts down on the dissolved oxygen as well. Uh, so there we go. All right, now here we go with some diseases. This is again a great place to pause and I'll give you some time to do that and you should know the organism that causes the disease. These are waterborne and uh, from contaminated drinking water and then you should also know the effects as well. So why don't you pause. And now that we're back, uh, we'll move on from here. But these are ones that, uh, again, you should make sure you have a good idea of, uh, of these, these slides. Okay, so there are tests that we can be talking about um, for water quality, and you should be aware of these tests as well. One of them is for E. coli, the coliform bacteria that usually comes in uh, waste products as well, in a fecal matter. The coliform bacteria itself is not... Uh, dangerous to us uh, in particular, but it does indicate that there's things like fecal matter in the water, and of course that is uh, bad for us. The dissolved oxygen reading is important as well because the life in the water needs the dissolved oxygen to live, and if those levels are low, of course, that is a problem. So here are some of the tests that we could be talking about. Um, there are species that we can take a look at, like uh, bottom uh, feeders, uh, like mussels that are at the bottom of the water, and uh, with the amount of toxins they have give you an idea of the amount of toxins that are in the water as well, and there are bacteria as well that could be helping you. Uh, determine <clears throat> if there's problems. Here you have some yeast that glows if there's toxic chemicals. Right, turbidity is the cloudiness of the water. This gives you an idea of how much sediments are in the water and if there's a lot of sediments in the water then um, you got uh, probably a problem. And the cloudier the water is you'd say the more turbidity it has. A test for the turbidity uh, that you could talk about is the um, seshi discs. And these are uh, basically discs that uh, they put into the water, maybe they lower it into the water, and you see how far you can lower it until you can't see the disc anymore. And of course, the, if you can't lower it very far until you can't see the disc, then you've got cloudy water. That's a high level of turbidity. Sometimes they take a water column with a disc on the bottom, and they fill the water in until they can't see the disc. But either way, it's a way of measuring how deep the water will be when you can't see any more in it. So uh, the quicker that happens, the more turbidity or cloudiness there is in the water. Okay, and these are cattails that were mentioned as natural indicators, and when they're having problems, there might be problems in the water, so they're an indicator species. Okay, so this is the idea of uh, dissolved oxygen. Uh, so the amount that you want, parts per million of oxygen, and this is a good thing to know, the baselines for what is healthy water and what is not healthy water. All right, so there's your dissolved oxygen readings. And uh, okay, so a uh, nice thing about uh, water that's moving is it can clean itself, and there's natural ways for that to happen. And one thing is the idea of the dilution, that the pollution that you have is pretty thick at the beginning, but as it goes downstream, it gets uh, you know diluted. And uh, so that'll take away from the uh, pollutions there. Um, the uh, wastes that go into the water are maybe broken down by bacteria, but that takes time. And as the bacteria is breaking it down, it increases the biological oxygen demand. The bacteria needs that oxygen. So uh, if there's wastes in there, that means the bacteria can 
thrive, but it also means that the demand on oxygen is, uh, is a lot higher. So now we talk about the idea of an oxygen sag curve, and that's what this is here. And you can see the, where the point source is of the solution. There's the pipe, and that puts the material in there that is a pollutant that the bacteria will go after. And so you can see that the amount of dissolved oxygen drops off because the BOD, the biological oxygen demand, goes way up. And different kind of species can live in these different conditions. So you can see how what was normally going on in the stream is now changed because of the pollutants that human beings are putting in, into it. But downstream, you get back to where you started, the oxygen levels go up and the biological oxygen demand goes down. So that's the idea of the dilution as it goes downstream. And there is your oxygen sag curve. Okay, so in uh, developed countries, we have figured this out uh, in the 1970s. We really started to figure it out in the United States and in Britain. And uh, just like students who wait till the last minute to study for a test, uh, human beings are like this. Sometimes we wait until the last minute. And the Ohio, uh, the river in Ohio, the Cuyahoga River, um, we figured it was time to start cleaning it up when that river was on fire. There were so many chemicals in the fire that the, the river itself was on uh, fire. And that gave us the idea that we should probably think about cleaning it up. And we've had great success with that. All right. Now, I uh, mentioned that for the uh, Clean Air Act, it was uh, an event that happened in Denora, Pennsylvania that kind of triggered the Clean Air Act. The Clean Water Act is uh, triggered by the idea of what happened in the Cuyahoga River in the United States and in the Thames River, which goes through London in uh, Great Britain. There was a time when people thought they could just throw all the garbage in the river and be done with it. We're learning differently now. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, here's a guy in uh, Seattle who, uh, this is one of these stories again where uh, we can really get a around to making some changes and one person can make a bit of a difference and here's a person who put some pressure on some companies and uh, also got people involved and a nice uh, successful cleanup there. And as I mentioned, Seattle has been a real success story in that way. All right, so the rivers are polluted. We dump the untreated sewage into them, the industrial waste as well. And in the developing part of the world, uh, there are even bigger problems with that. And uh, these are high areas of population as well. And we have to get rid of the uh, garbage somehow. And unfortunately, a lot of it makes it into the rivers. And we know now that that causes a lot of problems. All right, so here's a river in China. And you can see it's uh, it's been highly degraded, as the uh, caption says there, highly polluted and just filled with garbage, a river of garbage. And uh, here they are dumping garbage in Peru. All things that we did in the United States too. And, and uh, so uh, maybe the whole world will catch on that uh, this uh, really isn't a solution to the problem of what to do with the garbage. But we're gonna see in the uh, later chapters that that is a real big issue, how much garbage we have. Uh, but dumping it in the river doesn't seem to be the best way to do it. Okay, lakes have a little bit more problem. They're stratified by layers of temperature. So the, um, you know, the hotter water is up at the top, it gets a little bit more light, and the colder water is at the bottom. So the pollutants aren't moving from layer to layer to be diluted. They are kind of staying stagnant where they're at. Okay, obviously a lot less movement in a lake than there is in a, uh, in a river or a stream. Uh, so there's a little bit, there's hardly any of this vertical mixing. Now this is a little bit different when the uh, temperature changes. When the temperature changes, there's typically more oxygen at the surface, but the oxygen goes a little bit lower than it went before because uh, that stuff will be able to, uh, um, the warmer levels will be a little bit lower. And uh, the amount of nutrients that are at the bottom can uh, also start to shift around there too. They can start coming up to the top when the temperature, uh, when the temperature gets a little bit warmer. Uh, so could, because uh, hot rises and cool uh, sinks. Uh, so that's the idea on that one. Okay, so cultural eutrophication we've talked about before. Eutrophication are the nutrients that go into a uh, lake, let's say, and a little bit of that is a good thing, but the cultural eutrophication, as we've talked about in class many times, is the amount of nitrates and phosphates that go into the water, and uh, that's, uh, that's just too much of a good thing, and we've talked about the algal blooms that come from that, and we'll talk about those a little bit later in this chapter as well. Oligotrophic lakes are crystal clear waters, and that's because there are low levels of nutrients, so there's not a lot of life in those rivers. But these are uh, vocabulary words you should be aware of.
Okay, so um, yes, talked about the idea of the cultural eutrophication leads to the algal blooms. This is the uh, bio, uh, the bacteria goes after the algae, which is going to increase the biological oxygen demand, and that means there'll be less dissolved oxygen going on, and there's just too much of the nutrients in there right now, um, and. Uh, that is going to lead to less oxygen in the water. It's going to lead to fish dying because there's not enough oxygen for them. And uh, it's also going to lead to an idea of less photosynthesis with plants that are maybe lower in the lake because the sunlight is being blocked by the algae. And that's the idea of the cultural eutrophication, something that we will have discussed by now in class many times by the time you get to chapter 20. Okay, so uh, the nitrates and phosphates, getting those out of the uh, fertilizers is a good idea. In New Jersey, they want uh, slow-releasing nitrates and phosphates so it doesn't all go into the uh, water at once. And uh, there you go. It takes a lot to clean these up. Maybe pumping air back into the lake, that sounds uh, not very efficient and pretty costly as well, time-consuming also. So that's the idea. All right, back to Lake Washington again uh, in the Puget Sound in the Seattle area. And just like I've said before, they used to put a lot of wastewater treatment into there. And um, I guess they uh, let their guard down a little bit. So some of that is uh, getting back into the system. Uh, but they've uh, had general success in doing that. They were dumping into the uh, water. They weren't paying attention to it. And now they've got a pretty good cleanup going there. We have problems with the Great Lakes uh, where there's all this fresh water for the United States. It's um, the most um, fresh water uh, that we have here. It's a big area of fresh water, so it could be very useful to us. But And it is, but there is lots of uh, pollution going on in there as well. Cultural eutrophication is a big problem. Raw sewage was dumped in there. Um, there is uh, pesticides and mercury coming in, and we've talked about how that can get into the water. And uh, so these are problems with the Great Lakes and that um, fresh water. Also, invasive species are becoming a, uh, a big issue for them there. And uh, they have, uh, uh, like in uh, lots of places, developed over the wetlands and found that that is a problem. So the uh, Great Lakes are uh, something to look into there as well for uh, water pollution. Okay, groundwater itself uh, that we talked about uh, in uh, previous chapters is uh, contaminated in many areas from these things that we're talking about. So gasoline that gets in there. I mentioned the parking lots. Um, I did mention the idea of the cleanup that's going on here too and the way that things can get dispersed in time. But the idea of the plume is that everything is concentrated at the start and then the plume moves out like this. So if the plume... And that's uh, something that you could talk about with air pollution as well. With the things that are coming out of a smokestack, they're going to go like this. They're going to become more dispersed, so they're going to be less concentrated, but they are covering a great amount of distance. And groundwater isn't like lakes or rivers. It's not going to clean up as readily. It's just going to mix in and stay there. And, of course, that becomes a problem, especially when we're talking about an aquifer where it's very, very slow-moving. So that's the idea there of the uh, aquifers and the problems that they have. Very slow moving. There's not a lot of dissolved oxygen, and uh, it takes a long time. So we talked about DDT as well. So we find that in the uh, groundwater, and, and then it doesn't really get out of the system uh, too readily. And uh, here we're also talking about the idea of lead and arsenic uh, causing problems. All right. Uh, bring a little bit of light back onto the subject. And uh, there we go. All right, so this is, uh, again, a great uh, idea of showing you all these different things that are happening. Uh, De-icing of the road salt. So, you know, you put we put all the uh, road salt down on the road when we have our winter weather. That gets into the atmosphere. It helps keep the roads clear for a little while, but there we go. Uh, maybe we're putting hazardous wastes into the ground. we got to make sure that they never leak. That's going to be a problem. Uh, you can see the idea of the landfill over here. If things are coming out of the landfill, uh, maybe mercury from batteries that people are putting into the landfill. All these different things that we do to have the lives that we like. And uh, here you can see all the connections and the problems that they could cause to our water as well. Uh, the gasoline stations, uh, there's one across the street from my house. And uh, that one, um, they took tanks out, and now they put new tanks in. And there's, they've got to do all kinds of things with making sure that the ground is clean when they do that because we're well aware of it now. But weren't as much in the past, and we're still living with some of the problems created with uh, the time when we didn't know as much about these uh, possible detrimental effects.
Okay, so here you go. You get you get another idea of the gas station. And like I said, um, when they took the tanks out across the street from my house down there in Jamesburg, there was a big environmental um, test that they had to do, and they had to make sure that everything was was cleaned up properly. So you get the idea here of how things can get into the groundwater. All right, so um, in other places in the United States, of course, uh, there are in other places where they're not uh, as, you know, where there's a little behind we are in the cleanup efforts, they are um, experiencing similar kind of problems, but maybe they're behind us on the cleanup in China has um, over extended themselves with the aquifers and they have find contaminated aquifers we find toxins in our aquifers as well and again here are some of the things from underground storage tanks that can leak out and get into the groundwater and we've seen that to be a problem so the gasoline or oil uh, this is an additive that goes into your gasoline and also the nitrate and we've talked about how dangerous that can be in the water um, so, um, a lot easier to prevent this stuff from happening than it is to clean it up afterwards. That is very time-consuming and very expensive and hard to do, the, uh, especially in the aquifers. How do you get to them to clean them up? It's a, it's a real issue once it happens. All right, here's another one of those great slides, things that we've talked about a little bit already, but this is a good place to pause, and I'll give you time to do that. Okay, so that should give you a good idea now that you're back uh, with the groundwater pollution and with all this stuff. It's a good idea to keep reviewing this information as you're getting yourselves ready for the tests to come and uh, building up your knowledge base as we go. Okay, so we can do things to purify the uh, water. We do this by our own, we have purification uh, plants, we have wastewater treatment plants that we uh, deal with, and so we can do this, purify the water before we drink it, that's a good thing. Um, they can take sewer water and turn it into drinking water. People don't like drinking poop water too much, but they have ways of doing that now, uh, and that's, uh, that's pretty great stuff that we've been able to do and uh, figure out how to take care of some of this stuff. Now, yes, UV radiation can break down some of the bacteria in there. Of course, I don't know about this one. Some kind of plastics, uh, especially if they have those uh, BPAs in them, uh, that can leach out some other things that are problems uh, problematic. But there are filters and things like the life straw. We'll give you a little picture of some people using the life straw here. And the idea is that there's a purification process that's going on between uh, the water going from the uh, the water source here to the people and along the way you're going to purify it so uh, as you're drinking the water and we do a lot of this now putting water filters on our uh, taps if we're concerned with that kind of thing and um, so purifying the water before we drink it is is something that human beings have figured out how to do and are doing Okay, so here's the idea of uh, talking about maybe using nature to purify the water. Watersheds, you know, wetlands are really good as the water goes through this uh, for purifying things. And uh, the New York City water all comes from reservoirs in the Catskill Mountains and goes through Westchester County and comes down to New York City all by gravity in a lot of cases. And, uh, you know, the question is, you know, are we going to purify this by building water purification plants or are we going to let uh, maintain the watershed itself, which has uh, some other positive results, and use that to clean up the water. And that's the idea of this, uh, this business with New York City's drinking water. Really fascinating how New York City has become the city it has, and in large part because you can get a lot of water. If you can have a large city, you're going to have, a, have to have a lot of water for the people and for all the things that you're trying to do there. Okay, well, that is the buzzer, so I'm going to pause here and come back to this video a little bit later. Thanks for watching. I'll be back in a little while. Okay, so I'm ready to continue the video here uh, where we left off. And of course, we were talking about the idea of uh, water pollution. So in order to ensure uh, the safe drinking water that we have in the United States, we do have the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act. Good time to talk about again the idea that they expect you for the AP exam and for my tests as well to understand all the different laws and what's involved with them and it's really a big undertaking to, under, uh, to even uh, know what all the laws are um, but in order to do well, uh, in order to really understand what's going on you'll have to know the uh, laws and also a little bit about them. 
Okay, so the Safe Drinking Water Act, of course, uh, there are some people who are going to want to strengthen where it is and some who are going to weaken it, and this is one to weaken it. And these are all the back and forth as political uh, tides change as well. What I have a link here is to the uh, government site for uh, Safe Drinking Water, and uh, I would say that it's good to do a little bit of research about each one of these things. So here's a page uh, for the uh, Safe Water Drinking Water Act. And um, here's the basic information about your drinking water. And this ties into things that we've done before, uh, the regulations that go along with it. And um, yeah, so the regulated contaminants, let's say any one of these links will get you some in interesting information. Um, here are some of the things that we've talked about, the microorganisms that they uh, check for. Um, so these are very interesting things. So HPC, the heterotrophic plate count, we haven't discussed that before in class. No health effects, but it does tell you how much uh, bacteria is in the water. Um, here's something for Legionnaire's disease. Uh, I do mention earlier the idea of E. coli, not a threat in itself, but it is from uh, fecal matter, <clears throat> as I mentioned before. <clears throat> Here's turbidity that I mentioned, and each one of these things is a link. So if you can take five minutes here or there and uh, figure out what's uh, a little bit more about each one of these topics, um, you're going to do very well. Just keep gaining your knowledge little by little. Turbidity, as I mentioned, is the cloudiness, and I did mention seshi disks as far as that. But again, here you can see, and this is so useful, and we've done a lot of it as well, it tells you the potential health effects. That's the column over here uh, next to the right, and then the sources of it. So if you come down to turbidity, as we've discussed before, you can see soil runoff is uh, part of that, and it's a measure of how cloudiness it is. And here's what it causes. Nausea, cramps, diarrhea, headaches, probably not the greatest water to drink. So again, I'm just kind of breezing through here, but I do recommend that you follow some links here and there. The information is so easily accessible. Here's arsenic that we've talked about. It comes from erosion from natural deposits. Uh, also comes from uh, waste from electronics. So that's good to know. And it can cause cancer, problems with the circulatory system. So here's a lot of things that we've talked about and some that we haven't talked about directly. We talked about cyanide. That comes from uh, metal factories. And we've also talked about it as in gold mining. Uh, so it causes nerve damage or thyroid problems, and we've talked about the thyroid. Here's a little bit more talk about uh, lead, co uh, corrosion of household plumbing, uh, natural deposits, paints, batteries. Uh, but you can see mental development troubles for children and for adults, kidney problems and high blood pressure. Here's mercury, which we've talked about, uh, and on and on. So it just gives you a really good idea um, that very quickly you can find out uh, a bunch more information, information that uh, that are related to the topic. All right, so here we are back to our uh, presentation again, and um, you know maybe uh, the answer you would think is bottled water. If the uh, drinking water isn't safe, or I'm concerned about the drinking water, maybe I go with bottled water, um, and that seems to have gained a lot of momentum. Um, but bottled water doesn't uh, sometimes have the same standards of testing as tap water does, so that's pretty interesting. And remember, again, as we've talked about, it means that you're going to have to get, come up with all those plastic bottles. And then uh, do we recycle all of them, or do they end up in landfills, or they, do they end up uh, back in the ocean? I myself can drink water from the tap. Um, I don't have a problem with that, but I know people who won't do it because uh, they don't feel it's safe for them. Okay, so we know ocean pollution is a problem. We've talked about that as well. And uh, we know where the pollution is coming from, and mostly it's from the coastal areas. And we're realizing now that the uh, ocean waters can dilute some of this stuff over time, uh, and they can break it down, but there is no way, and there's no doing this stuff without effects. Um, cruise liners are uh, an issue. We are uh, figured out how to put these moving cities on, uh, on the sea, and people go out there and they seem to enjoy them. I've often wanted to go on one of those. Uh, but uh, how about the regulations of the dumping of their uh, sewage into the waters? Um, they're not supposed to do that. Can you stop that from happening? International waters become a question. Who has the rights? Very tricky questions all around. And again, wherever you dump any of this stuff, it can affect everybody. Classic tragedy of the commons.
All right, so we know sewage and agricultural runout, runoff. We've talked about nitrates and phosphates and algal blooms and the idea that oxygen can, can become depleted from areas. And here is, again, one of those great places that will give you the cause and effect, and it's a really good idea to pause and kind of understand all these things. I think you probably do, but just reinforce your knowledge. So I'll give you a moment to pause. And now I'll move on. But this is a great slide, as these are that I draw your attention to, for getting all of that information in one spot and making a lot of tie-ins. Here's a red tide, which is an algal bloom. Uh, so you get the idea here that it just uh, is an unhealthy lake at that point. Gulf of Mexico every year uh, comes into a whole oxygen depletion because of all the nutrients that come down to it. And uh, usually that comes down the Mississippi River, but there's a whole huge zone that uh, becomes a no-go zone for life. Oxygen depleted zones and not much can li uh, live there. And is it uh, going to be the point where it happens year-round, or does it continue to just be a seasonal thing? But right now, that's, uh, that's something that we should be watching. Uh, you can see there's all these rivers that are draining into this area, and that red zone there uh, is the oxygen-depleted zone. And every year, there is uh, no oxygen to be had in that area, very little oxygen to be had. And of course, that's going to change the range of tolerance and the species that can exist there. Uh, but it certainly changes things, and it seems to be an anthropogenic cause. Okay, so uh, pollution from oil is a problem, of course. Uh, we can uh, transport this stuff um, by truck, by train, by boat, by uh, pipeline. So a lot of different ways we do this. And if there is a problem, uh, if it gets out into the environment, it causes a serious problem. So uh, these are pollutants that are very very, very uh, difficult to clean up once they get into the environment. There have been a couple of these uh, that have been uh, big oil spills, 1989, the Exxon Valdez is a good one to be aware of, uh, really brought the environmental awareness to the uh, forefront, and 2002 as well. And uh, we also talked about the one with the BP Horizon that I mentioned earlier in this uh, chapter. Okay, so these are volatile organic uh, hydrocarbons. They kill a lot of things. We know that the glop that gets on the animals is a problem, and the components that are particularly gloppy, if they don't get on the uh, uh, wildlife immediately or if they don't get into it, it will sink down, and that affects the bottom dwellers, and that makes some sense. Okay, so uh, faster recovery from the crude oil than the refinery oil. I guess that's a, a good thing to think of. We are always coming up with new ways to potentially clean these things up, so that's an optimistic thing. But of course, no matter what we do, the cleanup is tougher uh, to do than the prevention. One of the things that they've done for prevention of the spills is double-hold uh, boats. The hull is what keeps the uh, ship separate from the outside. So if you have a double hull, this way if one of the hulls breaks, you you have uh, double the protection from your oil getting out into the ocean. But it will be no time soon that we stop transporting oil uh, on the ocean, or through waterways, really. Okay, so here is another one of those great slides and a great place of making a bunch of connections to the prevention and the cleanup. And most of the stuff we have talked about, and uh, I will uh, again give you time to pause. And hopefully that was enough time for you to pause your computer, start back up, and get an idea of um, the prevention and the cleanup for coastal water pollution. Over 80, 80 percent, about 80 percent of the world's population lives on the coast, so it's, uh, it's a big issue there on what humans are doing. Okay, uh, surface water pollution is something that we want to cut down on, of course. If we can cut down on the erosion, that'll be a good thing. We've talked about over and over again about how the fertilizers are problems. Buffer zones of vegetation are possibilities over in uh, Thompson Park, uh, right where we live. Um, there is a parking lot. There is a parking lot where the tennis courts are, a little bit uh, raised up there. And there's a parking lot right near them and a basketball court as well. And, of course, anywhere there's a parking lot, there could be oils and things that are dripping off of cars that are going to drip down into the water. And that parking lot is a really good example. You may be able to picture it. It rolls downhill right into the water, and that water eventually rolls out to the ocean through the Manasquan uh, uh, River. So um, they have in there a 
a buffer zone, uh, and there's a sign that tells you about it too, right at the bottom there, and it's specifically for that purpose. So that's a good idea as well. Organic techniques are, of course, going to be good because then you're not putting these pollutants out there in the first place. Okay, so if you control the runoff, uh, regulation for livestock, here in New Jersey, I've talked to people who feel that uh, for horses, that the distance that you have to keep your horses and the uh, waste from the horses uh, from the water, they feel is too far. Um, that's an interesting uh, standpoint, and I've heard uh, college professors say that the regulations are too far. Uh, but who decides these things? And these are very interesting questions, and people, of course, have to know a lot about them. So the animal waste is a big issue, especially uh, since we mass produce uh, livestock for uh, meat, red meat and all that stuff. Okay, so here's the Clean Water Act. Once again, for the Clean Water Act, I would recommend you go to your government site, take a little quick look at the Clean Water Act and what it's all about. We got the drink, Drinking Water Act, the Clean Water Act, and you're supposed to be aware of all of these things and, and what goes into them. So uh, there we go. And they're also looking at a little bit of a cap and trade kind of thing with uh, pollutants into the water as well. And we've discussed cap and trade into uh, in other chapters. Okay, so um, there have been a lot of improvements. As I mentioned, the Cuyahoga River um, was on fire in Ohio. At that point, we figured we we're going to turn things around. We still have unsafe places, but we uh, now also have come a long way in a lot of uh, ways. But in a lot of ways, and uh, with the mercury, that's the HG at the bottom here, and pesticides, and DDT, and other pesticides, uh, and toxic materials that we've talked about that get into the fish, we know that they're going to be in in the uh, in there for a long time they're very persistent okay so these are things that we've talked about and of course again there's the yin and yang whether we should weaken or strengthen the clean water act and these things go back and forth okay sewage treatment is uh, what we should be talking about now we have a lot of wastewater of course and what we do is our wastewater now goes to a wastewater treatment plant and I will at some point put up a virtual wastewater treatment plant tour for you, um, but the uh, idea is that there are three steps. And the first step is physical. So they'll just put a physical barrier that'll keep big things from getting in there. And the secondary one is a biological process where the bacteria will eat away at the stuff and uh, take away the stuff that's toxic. And that's a pretty good thing that we figured out how to do. And it gives off a, a bad smell, I can tell you. I've been to one of these wastewater treatment plants, uh, but it does seem to be effective when the water is tested coming out at the other side. Tertiary is a last step, doesn't always exist, but it's a good one. That's the bleaching and the chlorina uh, chlorination, the UV radiation that gets rid of all the bacteria, or as much as we possibly can. There are some things like uh, heavy metals, toxic metals, that we're just not built for taking out of the system in the wastewater treatment plant. Um, also, prescription drugs are a problem because we don't have a method here for taking them out of the water. So whatever people flush into their toilets, uh, you know, that does become something that will end up in the wastewater treatment plant. And after that, that water is released back out into the environment. So it's a, it's a very careful deal there. But it is something that has improved water quality immensely, that we don't just dump our sewage back into the water. Uh, and it has also increased the uh, health in the developed world. And the United States is a great example of that. Okay, one thing to think about is right now we know we have sewers outside of our houses, and that sewer is also for the storm runoff. So what happens when you have the sewage and the storm runoff coming down to the wastewater treatment plant at the same time? We're treating the wastewater, but now we're also treating the storm runoff, which presumably isn't a wastewater. But now our wastewater treatment plants, if there are not separate pipes, have to deal with both of those things. And of course, there's a risk uh, in swimming in these waters, and uh, we should be aware of that. Okay, this is the idea of a sept tank, septic tank, and this is another way of getting rid of the uh, waste without having to get into the environment. So this is one where you're locally doing it at your house. This is an alternative to having a, uh, your public sewer, which goes to the wastewater treatment plant. You can do it at, at home. You can see the sludge collects at the bottom, and that uh, sludge is then taken away uh, by a company will come in and uh, clear out your septic tank. Some of you may have septic tanks or know people who do. That's the way the septic tanks are done, and it's good for us to be aware of that as well.
Okay, so this is the two stages, the main stages for um, for the wastewater treatment. So this is the primer, as we've said, and you should distinguish between the primary, secondary, and the tertiary that I pointed out. This diagram talks about the primary and the secondary. So first there's a screen to keep the stuff out, and then again, this is a separation thing, a physical separation. So the water that goes through is then uh, set in with the uh, activation, and that's where the bacteria is going after, where they're aerated and with the bacteria. And hopefully that will settle out some more of the garbage and you can see they collect all of that. That's where the sludge drying bed comes in. And really what they're showing you here at the end of the secondary station is the chlorine. And again, as I said, they sometimes use UV radiation as well for that uh, to disinfect. And then it goes out to the river, the lake, or the ocean. And that's uh, the stages of wastewater treatment, and you should be aware of them, of course. Okay, so there are things that we can do, of course. Right now, toxic wastes that are done at industrial sites are the responsibility of the industrial sites to get out of the water uh, stream. So we could do a little bit better with that, perhaps. Uh, maybe composting toilets where we're not sending it out to the, west we oh, <laughs> the wastewater treatment plant. And um, another thing that we can do is use uh, nature. Nature is uh, set up for this kind of thing. So maybe we can set up a, uh, a, a more modeling on nature to have na natural uh, processes clean up the water for us. So there we go. Um, and here's a scientist who's tried some of that. And they've done a lot of tests these scientists had on the different plants and what different plants are good for getting out different stages of uh, the toxins. And here you go. And this runs the uh, water through a bunch of different uh, areas. And uh, here's the person who did that in uh, Rhode Island. Okay, so um, we can cut down on these things. If people uh, don't want water pollution, then they're going to put pressure um, to get away from that. And we seem to want clean water now, so uh, that's uh, something that we have uh, seem to have decided. Recently in Flint, Michigan, or recently at the time of the making of this video, um, we realized that uh, sometimes we get water that isn't exactly safe or you know, for reasons, and that has created a great outcry here. In developing countries, uh, they're a little bit farther behind. China has a plan to boost uh, up on this uh, stuff, but um, again, they're a little bit behind. They're probably where we were not too long ago. Okay, so here is again another one of these great slides that uh, gives you uh, things in one step, uh, one, one shot here that can be uh, solutions to water pollution. So why not I give you a moment to pause. And now that you're back, I can go on. And uh, here are things that you can do to uh, reduce the water pollution as well. So I'll give you another chance to pause. Okay, hopefully you got the idea of things that you can do and they make sense to you. And that ends this video. It's a rather long one, but it's a big part of, uh, part of the exam and a part of the class as well. And it's a good understanding to have about the world around you. So uh, water pollution, remember to name names. Think about the idea of taking all the sources of the water pollution and also putting in the effects, what the human health effects are. Well, I hope this video is helpful for you and I look forward to seeing you back in class.